we were surrogates to the medical people. But I didn't like the idea of the doctor writing orders that we were to follow mm. uh, when they would never had nutrition classes, for example, and they were writing diet menus, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. this didn't make sense. So um, uh, we started teaching assertiveness. In fact, I just found our early notes on assertiveness, and they still hold. They mm -hmm. still hold. And in fact, women were more assertive in the 70s than when ERA was starting. We were. We, we stood up for ourselves. Now, there's a feeling of, uh, uh, and I don't know, it's not a good feeling about women, and they don't feel like they can make a change. You can. Yeah. You just have to step your foot out, do it courteously, and say, I'm wondering if you have thought about this. And I always ask, you wouldn't be against equality for all Americans, would you? My own senator said, I have to think about that. <laughs> I have to think about that. And uh, somebody overheard and went like, oh boy. Um, but he has since co-sponsored my bill, and I will tell you how I got him to co-sponsor. I'm oh, wondering yeah, all over. Yeah, do tell us. Yeah. Uh, seven years, I would take constituents to see him in his local office about the Equal Rights Movement, because I'm doing it 15 years. And I said, you know, we have a bill again, uh, and, uh, you know, this is the reason. The, he said, well, I have to, I, I don't understand this point, you know. So every year I'd have to go back and get you know, documentation about that point. This new objection. Yeah, his new objection. Every mm -hmm. year, the legislature had a new objection. He had a new objection. So, and every year he'd send me out to do this useless stuff he never read, probably. Mm -hmm. Well, one year, he was running for office for re-election, and um, my husband had a birthday. So he was big on sending birthday cards that year, never before, never since, but he did that year because he was running for office. And my husband got... I gotcha, I gotcha. Okay, I thought you were going to ask a question. Okay, so um, I said, honey, I have an idea. And by this time, uh, my husband had come around to see, he said, I never thought, my husband said, I never thought about women not being equal. And so he works with me, he does my graphics, and. That's my speeches and all that he's working on. Well, that's a question I want to ask yeah. you when we go back. Okay, yeah. so go ahead. Okay, so to just end this little story. Um, he wouldn't co sponsor for seven years and he was just dragging me, just like all the other legislators. Yeah. So my husband got a birthday card from him, and my husband says, Why did I get a card from Senator Jones? You know? And I said, He's running for office again. Oh, okay. Then I got the idea. I said, How about if you called him? Which my husband's pretty reticent, so he wasn't happy about that. But I wrote out the script for him, and he said, to, he picked up the phone, he called the senator, and he said, I so appreciate the birthday card you've sent me. He said, but you know, I'd much prefer you co-sponsor my wife's bill 363. The next morning at 10 o'clock, he did. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just, it just took, I think it took a man talking to him about ERA. Maybe. Right? Right. Not sure, but I got him on board. That's all I cared about. Um, okay, and where should I go from there? Other things. Well, I mean, oh, well, how did I do it with the uh, USF and uh, placate this other uh, chapter that was angry that we had struck out on our own? Um, well, I brought them on board with us. That's how I did that. But to get, we all co coral got together and. Um, wrote a letter and I called all of the female faculty that were uh, in a group complaining, got their points of view and put them in the letter. Mm -hmm. And we got, I wrote and got the statistics on the various um, wages that people were making. So Because it's a public these. university. Yeah. So that's public record, right? right? What the professors are Exactly. Yeah. So you're entitled, you're entitled, everybody's entitled to a lot more information that they need think. that they think they can't get. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and of course the Freedom of Information Act of 1978, that helps a lot. But you don't know, I'm always successful with that. But, um, so we did get her, and we did speak with her, and she's a fine woman, and um, 
the head of, she was the, she, the, the, the president dean. Of, she, she was, was the dean. president, excuse me, president of USA. She was the president of the university. Betty Castor, mm -hmm. who then became a senator, and now her daughter is a senator. Yeah, that's um, why I know her name. Um, very nice woman. And of course, it's not easy to change all those policies and all of that, but she set about doing it. Mm -hmm. And it did become um, a, an actual an actuality. So, How you know, she, and, and every time you're successful like that, you grow two inches. Right. You know, you really do. Right. Uh, and your your brain gets bigger and more creative and strategic, mm -hmm. and you get more respect when you speak up for yourself. You do. Well, it's interesting in, in good too. ways. Not oh, yeah, no. Assertiveness yeah. and aggressiveness are not the same, the same thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> aggressiveness is when you're stomping on the other person to get your way. Right. Whereas you're just asserting your human rights, which we you need to be doing. The position that needs to be represented, or yeah. the right kind yeah. of food for this patient. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You, there's so many places where women need to speak up, and don't. Uh, in one particular case, I'm uh, mind blowing case I can remember a particular very large, well-respected national organization here in Florida, the Florida chapter, um, I told them what I was doing and uh, um, and how I was going about the ERA and so forth, because they had endorsed it years ago. Sure. But they they moved away, and that's another little aside. I've found that organizations that supported the first time, when the time limit was reached in 1982, right. Some people died. Uh, people went. Women went broke. There were so divorces and so forth. Yeah. Yes, people fell apart. Exactly. Yeah. And so when this came up again, um, they would look just sort of downhearted, you know. So we had to bring them back on board. It was such a huge loss. Yes, you know, we worked a decade, them. A uh, decade know, of work. If you're under yeah. what fifty or forty, maybe. You don't even know what the ERA is now unless they teach it, you know, in school, and they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, even large organizations don't. Uh, but I was talking about this large organization. Where was I going with that? Uh, I had to speak before 734 women on the ERA, and uh, they dragged their feet on making it a priority, and it never did become a priority. But I was going to say something about that particular organization again. But they're all, if they're big and more than 20 years old, you're right, it's a bureaucracy for the most part. And there's, there's territoriality. Well, that that's, that ha it, it's a course. difficult thing because, you know, when coming from a position of feminist you know, philosophy is my background, I love there's it. a <laughs> lot of work, there's a lot of work thinking about what feminist principles of organization would be right or should be mm. um, and strategies for getting around the habit it's just it's the habit of our culture territorial thinking so you have to consciously intervene with yourself <laughs> you know I sometimes being, to being get around it. it and so strategies for yeah. doing that kind of thing and, and working collectively um, without coming to the place where absolutely everybody has to agree on everything all oh, the time, no. mm -hmm. but can... Keeping the eyes on the prize. Can the one work prize together. That links us. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We must and do that. It's, it's, a really, it's, a, it's a really complicated area of study because there's so much about the history of our culture that goes against it, you know, against that way of thinking and um, creating uh, Just for women, you mean? Or for everybody. For population? You know, think about, think, about, think about how governments think about allies. Right? Yeah. Um, they're incredibly strategic, and it's basically a process of using each other to get something that you want. Yes. Rather than um, genuinely hooking up for a goal, right? Mm -hmm. The And yeah. then trying to figure out, do we maintain this alliance forever? Do we let it break? What's it for? How does it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because it's, uh, it's a means to an end, and in fact, the more theoretical areas of feminism, they work on trying to figure out how to make the alliance itself part of the end, right? If you want to have a new culture when you come out the other side of this process that is no longer patriarchal, you're going to have to decide on completely new ways of organizing and working together. Mm -hmm. 
The old I'm, pattern can't come with you. And I think and that's so overwhelming making, well, to me. Sure, but making those choices that. one little bit is a t at a time mm. as you go along, mm. you can start to build those new kinds of patterns. So, for instance, you were looking with the other chapter in the other county, right? When you were working on the university page. Didn't even think about that. You were we looking for a different, you were trying to make an alliance over what they thought was their turf and an issue that you wanted to work on. Mm -hmm. And you figured out how to build that little cooperative space. And then in a feminist way of thinking, you build another little cooperative space, maybe around a different issue, right? Maybe with a different group. And maybe those eventually come together. And you wind up kind of stitching together a new way of working rather than trying to be responsible for the whole thing. You yes, know, that's, yes, yeah. you can't birth that all at once. No, but you can stitch it together a bit at a time. I mean, the world that we live in now was stitched together that way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, from and it has more endurance than than, yeah, you than know. something that just comes into being. Yeah, or just linking for convenience sake. Yeah. But my way of thinking is since E R A. Um, really covers most if not all women's issues and including the environment and other things once we have a voice as women those things will be easier to, to manage so ERE covers so much yeah you know? and um, because of that I I would dearly like to see and when I spoke with the capital this is what I said is how many here think that they could put aside felons' rights or other people's rights or overseas global rights, because all of those things, we'd have more power if we all sang the same song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of people said yes, but it, did, it doesn't really click. And I think, I think and because primarily because our legislators, if they think there's a crack between us, they're going to say, and they do say, mm -hmm. if they sense that, the women don't even know what they want. Why should I vote for this? Right. So we have to look solid, and we have to act solid yeah. with respect for each of our other mission statements, and yet, you know, all focus on this one goal because that solves all of the goals. It gives you it gives you the lever you can use to begin to solve all of the goals. Mm, that's what I mean. You know. Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking um, ahead, but the, when yeah, you think the ERA is a kind of umbrella, right? When we talk about gender you equal use treatment, to, you can use it to start twerking on other questions. So many parts of it. Yeah. Well, I said a, I said a similar thing a few months ago. You know about um, making trying to figure out how to. Um, make better alliances with women of color oh, yeah. because white feminists traditionally have been terrible at that. Um, I started a diversity group in my, uh, oh, in my now sorry. chapter when I was oh. president and we brought in, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt, but no, I have please. these little brain hitters. <laughs> no, um, please. <laughs> um, I looked around one day at the, at the now that I was running, Pinellas County now, and I said, I see too many white faces. I see all white faces. Mm -hmm. So we got together and we decided we were going to change that. We, div we started this diversity committee and we went, went into outreach mm -hmm. and we went to uh, where black women congregated. Mm -hmm. They had meetings and so forth, so we went there yeah, they have work. They have you know oh, huge they have, organizations, and, and we sat in the back. We didn't come in and say, "Well, we have the answer for you," you know, right? Because that you know it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but we had these meetings, and it was hard because there was a lot of mistrust of us. Yeah. You it know, I mean, it's well earned. Yeah. You know, so uh, they it gradually came, and and leaders mm -hmm. began to come from the black community. It, it never got to be very big, but the interesting thing is that, and I get chills thinking about how proud I am that we were able to do this and what I learned, was we could sit together, and I began to notice the group wasn't just a black side of the table and a white side of the table, it was, mm -hmm. and that was a plus. Uh, but then we began to talk about what makes us mad mm -hmm. about being a woman. Mm -hmm. And they had things, and we had things, and they were the same. One day, one of them said to one of the 
a black lady said, um, why do you let your men treat us that way? And somebody said, because they treat us that way, <laughs> too. And I learned things like um, the black culture, they're taught, this is what I was told by this one person in this group, uh, black people are taught not to look white people in the eye. Yes. And I didn't know that. And I was stunned. And um, one, one woman said she knows the story of, uh, uh, she had worked for a white family, you know, as, as cook and, you know, whatever, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, the family had a little girl. And she had a little girl. The two little girls would play together. And the, the black lady, the mom, was asked by the daughter one day, why do I have to call her Miss Sally? So that broke up, you know, that broke into our consciousness. And a lot of other things that ex were exchanged between us mm -hmm. cleared the air yeah. so beautifully. I wish I could remember all of them. And all of that racist feeling, anti-racist feeling came when I lived here in St. Petersburg just before the 50s when the big riots came here in St. Petersburg. Sure. I came home one day, I guess I was about 10, and at those times there was a, a drinking fountain that said whites only and the other said coloreds, now that I recall. Mm -hmm. I came home and I said, why are there two fountains? What are they getting out of theirs? I'm not getting out of mine. <laughs> and when my mom explained that difference, you know, mm -hmm. I said, when I grow up, I'm going to do something about that. Yeah. And I never did do more than that, except that I tried to home. Anyway, let me get back well, you to had, but you. One thing you did in, in those meetings that you had across these community lines and across these race lines is set up a kind of conversation that a lot of people have a difficulty having. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of organizations we have to be time. open to be uh, disagreed with and maybe. to being self-critical yeah. you know to catching yourself in a moment of you know repeating a cultural habit that you shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. anymore mm -hmm. right um, and that you were able to do that and have that develop that kind of trust have that kind of honest conversation you know see what was and I think similar grew, different but you know? it's as far as it went well, sometimes it is as far as it goes, you know? Sometimes people and organizations aren't in a place where they can capitalize on that well, right Well, how way, many, you know? you know, if you've got a brand new idea that everybody's kind of skeptical about, that's yeah. going to take a while. Yeah. So it's, I, it's somehow I, I, I came out of that and um, then uh, I launched into changing the laws of the state on nurse practitioners, particularly there are three types. One is an anesthesiologist, one is a, a midwife, certified midwife, and then there's a nurse practitioner. We're kind of all in the same bailiwick, but mm -hmm. with different specialties. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it um, why did, oh, I know what it was. I got incensed because I learned that here in Florida, there are lots of rural areas just like there are Everywhere, everywhere in America, America. Even, yeah. even in Manhattan there are rural areas. Um, but so I found that um, um, people were, um, I don't know how to say it, the, the, the nurse midwife part of it, um, there's nurse midwives certified as I am as a nurse practitioner after years of study, and then there are midwives, lay what they call lay midwives, mm -hmm. and um, I learned that lay midwives basically had very little training. They were the, just there to catch the baby, hmm. and, um, and and I'm saying this not out of criticism or or not to downgrade them because they served a purpose. But if the mother got in trouble, then all they knew was a sticker in a cab and say, don't tell where you came from and get to the ER. Hmm. Okay, that was the way it was. And so I began to look into it and uh, I made changes there in the law in Florida. 
because the way it was written that the lay midwives had three years of training. They had three years in which they were called students, I guess, but only 18 months of it was actual schooling and clinical work. Uh, and then they could 